Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unusual Careers. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a learning program specialist here at the National Zoo. Today, I'm going to be your host. Unusual Careers is the zoo's monthly webinar series held during the school year, which highlights the variety of careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math at the zoo and SCBI. Today, we are joining forces with Zoom membership to bring you the special Panda edition and celebration of Zhao Chi Ji's first birthday. As you probably know, the newest Panda Cub will be turning one next week on August 21st. So many people at the zoo have played such a pivotal role in not only his birth and care, but the success of all giant pandas. And today we are so lucky that we will get the chance to meet four of the faces behind the conservation of giant pandas at the National Zoo. So once again, welcome to Unusual Careers. I am so excited to welcome our first guest to the program, Steve Paris. Welcome, Steve. Why don't you start by introducing yourself? Hi, Shelly. My name is Steve Paris. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm a wildlife endocrinology lab technician at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Wow. So can you tell us what is endocrinology? So endocrinology is the study of the hormones in the body, which are produced by glands, and they travel through the bloodstream, and they have effects on organs throughout the body. Uh, they're very important for reproduction, but also other important processes like maintaining metabolism uh, and mediating fight or flight response. All right. So what sorts of things do these hormones tell us that you're looking at? There are many different hormones we can look at, and they'll tell us different things. Uh, one you've probably heard of is testosterone, which is a very important hormone. We can look at that in males to determine when they're coming into rut. Uh, we can also look at that to determine when young males are reaching maturity. Another hormone we like to look at is, is cortisol. Um, it's produced in the adrenal gland, sometimes called the stress hormone. But we can look at the patterns of cortisol to see if an animal is coping well, or maybe they're having a acute or chronic adrenal response to something in their environment. Uh, progesterone is another hormone that we look at a lot in the lab. Uh, in polyestrous animals, those animals who have more than one estrous cycle in a year, uh, progesterone can tell us where they are in their cycle. Uh, it also helps to maintain pregnancy and sometimes it helps us diagnose pregnancy too. Wow. So it sounds like hormones can tell us a whole range of things that can tell us when us or animals are stressed, when they're pregnant, near pregnant. That's really, really neat. And I do also want to point out that it looks like you are in the lab today. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm in the lab. You see my lab bench right behind me. Um, I spend most of my day at the lab bench. Here you see some pictures of me using my tools, the trade, um, Amazing. So can you tell us specifically what hormones are you looking at when it comes to giant pandas? When it comes to giant pandas, we're most interested in estrogen. Um, we'll look at Meishong's urinary estrogens and we'll watch them ramp up in concentration, uh, approaching what we call peak estrus. Um, that's the one time a year when a female giant panda is able to uh, become pregnant and produce a cub. Right after peak estrus is the time that we aim for doing an artificial insemination or an AI. All right, so to sum up, it sounds like giant pandas have a very complicated reproductive history as we know. So Meishan can only get pregnant for about, what do you say, 24 hours once a year. So you're identifying those hormones to know when the perfect time that we could implant her to hopefully result in pregnancy, right? Yes? That's right. Amazing. So what is that process like? How do you monitor those hormones? You mentioned urine. Um, how do you monitor those hormones and identify that? Well, yeah, it involves a lot of urine samples. Uh, we like to use urine with the pandas because they can be collected non-invasively. This means that the keepers can go into the enclosure after the animal has shifted to a different area and they can aspirate um, the urine sample off of the enclosure floor 
and it doesn't in involve interacting with uh, Mei Shang in any invasive way. So it, a lot of urine samples, when we get gearing up for this in the spring, we like to call it pandemonium. And uh, uh, when pandemonia comes, um, I'll, I'll take my supplies from the lab here and I'll move to the Rock Creek campus um, at the zoo and I'll be on call uh, 24 hours a day waiting to analyze every urine sample that Mei Shang has. Uh, we want the most up-to-date information about where she is, what her hormones are doing, so that we can make the most effective decisions for when to time that artificial insemination. That's incredible. So, you know, if Mei Shang, if the keepers collect a urine sample from Mei Shang at 3 p.m., you're running that sample at 3 p.m. If they collect it at 3 a.m., you are running that sample at 3 a.m., yeah? That's right. I set up a cot in an empty office in the vet hospital, and uh, I've been known to be getting woken up in the middle of the night by a urine, urine sample delivery. But fortunately, this, this time period is only about once a year, right? Just once a year. Great. Um, so what is some of the uh, technology that you use to look at her hormones? The test we use is called an immunoassay. Um, here are some pictures of some of the common tools that we use the most. It's maybe a little hard to see, but there's a blank microplate there on the white background. And that's a, a little self-contained um, test unit where we can put, put uh, small amounts of reagents and uh, make measurements on them. Here's, here's a closer picture of that plate and you'll see here I'm using my single channel micro pipette to put Mei Shang's urine samples in the plate. And each little well is an independent test where we can get a result. And now I'll come back with my repeater pipette and I'll add our immunoassay reagent, which starts the reaction. We're gonna let that incubate for two hours while that color develops. And then we will arrive to uh, the end of the assay where we can make our measurements. All right, and I actually think, oh, wow. Okay, so what are we looking at here? This is after everything reacted with the urine? Yep, this is after everything has reacted, and there are two sections on this plate. Um, on the left is a group where we have known concentrations. These are pre-prepared uh, samples where we know the quantity of hormone that's in there. And then on the right side, we have our unknowns. These would be May's urine samples. So look what's happening on the known concentrations. As the numbers are going up, as the concentration is getting higher, the color is becoming clearer. It's getting less green. So knowing that, if you look at the right side of the plate, you can kind of see where there's um, samples with high concentration of hormone and also low concentration of hormone. And we can compare the unknowns to the knowns to arrive at a numerical value. Wow. And I, so... I have another poll actually for our uh, viewers here. Let me launch this one. So we are looking at this real graph of Mei Shang's hormones. And I've put a couple points on here, A, B, C, or D. And I want our viewers at home to guess at what point do you think Mei Shang was at peak estrus? I'll give them a second to uh, take their guesses here. Um, so that is really, really cool. Now, is that a chemical reaction that's happening between the urine and the reagent? It is. That's so neat. Are, are, I have just a personal question. Are other chem hormones that you're measuring, do they react in a different color than that blue-green? There are, yes. Oh, very cool. All right, we have so many of these answers coming in. All right, this is actually looking quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll give folks another 10 seconds to answer here. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's see. All right. Majority of folks think that point A was peak estrus, but followed in second place was point C. So what are we looking at here, Steve? So point A is peak estrus. If you can see the legend in the middle of the chart, the red series are May's urinary estrogens. So that's the hormone that we're looking at when she's coming into her estrus. And you see it starts going up and up and up and it reaches the highest point at point A before it comes crashing back down. And that's when we want to do the AI. 
And if you look at the blue series, those are May's urinary progestogens, which start a slow rise all the way through her gestation till birth. So where was birth? Point D? Or yep. point D? Point D. Awesome. So with the red line, you were tracking that and at point A, like we mentioned, that was peak estrus. But then, oh, here we have the actual answers. At point B, that star is where you did the artificial insemination. And then the blue line is more tracking her potential pregnancy. And we saw that pregnancy. If you see that final point, Zhao Ji Ji was born August 21st. That's so awesome. So obviously your work is very important. Um, and by monitoring mage hormones, we were able to you know, conduct an artificial insemination and it was successful. He is here. How else are you helping the zoo's mission of saving species? Having this information about the animals is important to help the managers uh, make the best decisions about when to breed the animals in their care. Um, keeping the numbers of our zoo populations up, many of the species survival plans that manage the zoo populations don't allow new imports. So it's really important that we keep these zoo populations sustainable and um, yeah. That's wonderful. And we have so many other conservation success stories here at the zoo that that's just a wonderful story to touch on. Now, my last question for you, Steve, before we invite you back at the end for Q and A, we have tons of questions coming in for you. How did you get into this career? What type of education path did you follow? And do you have any suggestions for young folks who might be interested in a similar career? I grew up loving the outdoors, camping with my family a lot. And I also loved science. When I found out that conservation biology was a, a, a field of study, I, I knew that was what I had to do. And actually, actually I spent about five years uh, work, work, working in field ecology before I came to the lab. Um, I, I actually started as an intern here in this lab when I realized how much we could learn about these animals from just one sample and all the different hormones that we could look at. I was hooked and um, I came back and here I am today. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. We will see you in a little bit for a Q&A at the end. Yep. See you later. All right. Um, our next guest is Dr. Donald Neifer. Welcome, Don. Hi, Shelly. Can you hear me out there? Yes, I can hear you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Shelly. My name is Don, uh, Don Neifer. I am the chief veterinarian here at uh, the National Zoo with the Department of Wildlife Health Sciences. Wonderful. So what does a chief veterinarian do? Uh, a lot of paperwork. <laughs> Not as much veterinary medicine anymore. Uh, I manage about 20 uh, veterinary professionals, um, and we cover both the clinical medicine and the pathology services to support the collection at the National Zoo, as well as uh, uh, some of it at Front Royal. Um, personally, I still get to play a little bit, and I have been involved with monitoring uh, Mei Xiang's pregnancies through ultrasounds, and I've had the opportunity to conduct some of the uh, early checkups on um, uh, Xiao Qi Ji as, as well as Bei Bei in the past. That's really neat. So we just learned from Steve. So Steve's involved in kind of the process for hopefully getting her pregnant. And then this is where sort of you come in and you we've conducted the artificial insemination and now you're monitoring her through these ultrasounds. What are you looking for in these ultrasounds on Mei Shang? Um, so ultrasound is a form of diagnostic imaging. Some people are familiar with it, particularly anybody who's had a baby has, has had most likely had ultrasounds to monitor their pregnancy. Um, it's like x-rays, it's a type of, it's a way to look inside the animal or inside the person. With the ultrasound, we're really looking for any sub, subtle changes in, in uterine morphology or appearance, um, any signs of pregnancy or any evidence that we might be dealing with a pseudo pregnancy. And certainly when we confirm that a fetus is present or even before, we're looking to see if there's any, any problems with mom, if there's any problems with the baby that would uh, require us to um, intervene. Great. So how early on are you seeing fetuses on an ultrasound in a giant panda? Well, they are challenging um, as far as carnivores go. If you have a dog who gets pregnant, um, it's pretty much stepwise. You know when you can expect to see um, a fetus developing. The challenge with pandas and bears and a few other species, they are delayed implanters. And so even though the, the uh, conception 
occurs generally in the early spring, we do not see the uh, evidence of fetal growth until almost the end of pregnancy. Literally, if the insemination or the breeding occurs in May, we're really not expecting to see the fetal tissue until the end of July, the beginning of August, maybe a little bit later. So most of our ultrasounds that are done early on are just to get Mei Shang used to us doing this again with her. Um, she finds the whole thing enjoyable because she gets lots of honey water and lots of attention. Um, but we're really just looking at uterine changes. It's pretty boring. We definitely want to see progress, but is it, it isn't until the end of July for us or August that we really start looking for evidence of blood flow, of fetal development. Um, it's a challenge. And, and as many of you know, we're always waiting a very long time to know whether we have a conception that occurred or a suited pregnancy or maybe a, a resorption of fetuses. So That's they're not like any other carnivore I've ever worked on. Very, they have to just make everything challenging. Can you briefly um, tell us what we are seeing in this picture? <laughs> Besides me? Besides uh, yeah. You. Um, so um, we have a training shoot for, uh, for our pandas, and, and we actually have a lot of our animals here, not just mammals, but some of the birds, some of the reptiles who, who um, we utilize operant conditioning or positive reinforcement training. Um, these animals will interact. It's, it's up to them. Mei Shang is able to get up and walk away whenever she wants. Uh, we train them um, positive, with positive reinforcement to allow us to perform medical and husbandry related procedures voluntarily. It's really important if we have a sick animal because we don't want to have to anesthetize them just to get a blood sample. If we can get it voluntarily and recheck their kidney values or their, their liver values, awesome. Um, we could also run, um, get uh, hormonal screening. We can get blood work for hormones. We can get vaginal swabs on Mei Shang for hormones. But she also lets us um, perform a diagnostic ultrasound of her abdomen uh, and her heart for that matter. But here I'm actually ultrasounding her abdomen and it's part of our tracking the later stages of the reproductive cycle where we're trying to determine if she is in fact pregnant and going to make our summer very interesting, so. Awesome, so I just wanna point out a couple other things in this photo. So this is like Don mentioned, uh, a little shoot area where Mei Shang will voluntarily come in and the keepers have worked and trained them so well that she'll voluntarily lay down. And you can actually see quite in the background, a, a lone arm there with a bottle of probably honey water or dilute apple juice that's just reinforcing her saying, yes, you get a reward for laying down and letting Dr. Dawn uh, ultrasound your belly. So this is just a great example of that wonderful relationship between your team and the animal care staff to train these behaviors to allow this uh, diagnosis, the diagnostic uh, medicine. That's wonderful. Um, so have you ever confirmed pregnancy from an ultrasound? Uh, so yes, I, and I've been really fortunate. Um, we all get feathers in our cap uh, along our career. And uh, in 2015 with Bay Bay, um, and, um, and then again in uh, 2020 with, with um, Xiao Qi Ji, uh, I was able to see fetal uh, growth, fetal tissue. And actually what you're looking at here is, is my, um, I, I, it's, a, it's a drop the mic moment for me because it's actually the, you know, it's, it's the form skeleton. You can see the thoracic cavity with a beating heart and a, a limb that's thrusting forward in a rib cage. And this is Xiao Qi Ji. Um, and so um, I'm not the only veterinarian who has done this. Um, some of our sister institutions have, have gotten excellent images, but uh, I, I'm told this is the first two animals that were ever detected at the National Zoo. So I, I do, I don't give myself a lot of pats on the back, but I'll, I'll take some credit for that. But I, I, this could not have been done, honestly, if the keepers did not maintain these behaviors and this level of trust that the animals have for us to do this work. But yeah, this was, a, this was an awesome day. We did a lot of um, high-fiving and happy dancing before we got yeah. professional again, so. Absolutely, and there's just a picture zooming in. That is so cool that, how rare it is to confirm a pregnancy on an ultrasound right. and for you to have done it twice here. And uh, you can see in that, Shelly, that, that image is actually, uh, that's um, Bebe. And that's a much earlier um, point in the uh, the growth of the fetus versus the the one with the, the images, Xiao Qi Ji, where we were, we were not as close to delivery as I had thought, but we were really far along at that point. Which actually brings up my next question for you. So you've confirmed pregnancy on an ultrasound. What is next for you and your team? Um, 
well, after the high fives, you know, it, and, and the mental, then the mental gym gymnastics start and we, we have to plan for best case scenarios and worst case scenarios. Um, we prepare uh, working with the husbandry team um, with um, preparing the nursery, preparing emergency drugs and supplies, preparing um, things that we would need to use if we have to raise the, uh, the offspring. At the same time, there's more than once a daily communications with the endocrine group because we're really trying to determine how you know is uh is parturition delivery imminent and we've gotten pretty good and we keep moving the target but we always you know, it gets the uh, the range keeps getting shorter it's like watching a hurricane come into florida it's a very big cone and it gets tighter as you get get to the uh date of expectation so a lot of activity but we have the rest of the collection to take care of at the same time we do tend to uh cancel some of our elective procedures if we think we're in within a couple of days of a delivery of a panda baby. Um, and we all try to get our sleep because we never know what's gonna happen next. Absolutely. So we had obviously a very successful birth of Zhao Jiji. What you mentioned that you conduct some early medical exams on him once you got your hands on him. What do these entail? What are you looking for when you do these health checks? Sure. Any any neonatal or or or, or, fl or early chick or, or or any small animal, any human, um, you're looking for congenital defects, birth defects. Uh, you're looking for evidence of infection or inflammation. You're looking for any evidence that um, the baby's not thriving. Um, you know, from all all our observations, everything was going great. But you have to remember, even though these guys have been in a captive situation they haven't given up the wild in the way they behave in many ways. And it's not in your advantage to show signs of weakness or disease in the wild. It's really hardwired evolutionarily into these critters. And so we really want to get them on, on the, the front end of an issue. And to do that, we have to do some elective evaluations of the animal's blood work, of its condition, of its weight. Um, and then at some point, a little bit later, these animals, these mammals in particular, um, they do get a vaccination um, series, the same as your dog or cat would, the same as a human should. That's great. Um, again, tons of questions coming in, but before we move on to our next guest and see you a little bit later, can you tell us again how you got into this career and if you have any advice for young folks also interested in a veterinary <laughs> career? Sure. So I, I always had an interest in, in animals. It started, I had a lot of pets as a kid. Um, my mom wouldn't let me have snakes. So I rebelled in college and had about 15. But um, I watched a lot of programs uh, that a lot of people on here may or may not know. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, The Undersea, Revengers of Jacques Cousteau were big ones for me. Um, my appreciation for the natural world really got ignited by my dad. He took me on a lot of hunting and fishing trips throughout my childhood. And that got partnered with my um, this interest I had in this thing called biology. And I had some great professors um, at Millersville University, a real tiny school in Pennsylvania, or not so tiny, but Dr. Dave Ziegers and Cal Hepfer, all these people, my parents and them really are, they set me forth on this trip. I got exposed to laboratory animal veterinarians at the Hershey Medical Center during a summer externship at Zoo America in Hershey. They provided the medical care. And I, um, that ignited everything. I became single-minded to what I wanted to do and um, never looked back. Uh, my advice for folks would be, you should understand very early on that you will not be able to do your job, particularly in a zoo, but actually in life, unless you work with others and not just other veterinarians, but people from all vocations or, or jobs. And you gotta appreciate that everybody has something to offer to help you be better at your job. It's a collective effort. I love that. That's such a great point, Don. And, you know, I mentioned earlier just how many of my own team members and uh, members from other zoo departments are working behind the scenes. We wouldn't be here in this webinar if it wasn't for them. Thank you, Don. I can't wait to get some more of your answers uh, a little bit later. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next guest, I am thrilled to introduce our next guest and good friend of mine, Marty. Welcome, Marty. Hello, how are you? Good. Want to introduce yourself with your role? Sure. Uh, my name is Marty, um, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm an animal keeper at the Giant Panda House. I also work on Asia Trail with all the animals on Asia Trail. Wonderful. And I'm sure many of our members tuning in are very familiar with you. But can you just briefly tell us what is the role of an animal keeper? 
Sure. So um, we have what I consider the primary job, which is obviously taking care of the animals. So that's that's everything, you know, cleaning, picking up their poop, uh, which, you know, it sounds sounds like this. Oh, my God, you're picking up poop. And I have a, I have a degree, I've been, you know, but I pick up poop all day long. It's a big part of my job. Um, we feed the animals. We do all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, we're talking about this, this working with other units and other departments. Um, another big role we play is making sure that we are paying attention to the health and well-being of our animals. Um, and that, that plays a direct role to, to things like working with Don. Um, if we see, you know, it's, it's our job to determine whether or not there's something going on with an animal. And if we notice that, then we, we let our bosses know who then inform the vets. Um, and then I also think a big part is things like this, is working with, directly with the public. Um, we, because we are right on the front lines, we're out there working with the animals, um, we have lots of interactions with the public. And I think those are very critical um, in, in, as part of the role that we play here at the zoo. I mean, that's just music to our education team's ears. <laughs> um, I can't express enough how important, you know, educating and talking to guests are and getting them to love the pandas just as much as we do. Um, so how does your care sort of differ for um, Zhao Gigi versus maybe his parents or his siblings? So for, for we, so just real quick, we just call him Chi Gigi. It's so much easier to say. Sometimes okay. we call him Cheej. That's a, that's a kind of an in-house name that we have for him. Um, his name is a bit of a mouthful, but uh, oh. we've all gotten pretty good at saying it. Um, so, you know, early on, um, our role with him mainly is to just keep an eye on him, make sure that we're not seeing, again, that we're not seeing anything going on um, that, uh, that, you know, that he's eating, that he's growing. Um, and so we're pretty hands off to start. Um, we didn't get hands on him until I believe he was about two weeks old. We had him for really just got him out, did a quick wait, took some quick measurements and then gave him right back to his mom. Um, as Meishong starts spending more and more time away from him, we can get our hands on him a little bit more so we could get more weights. We could start scheduling um, exams with the veterinary team. As he's gotten older, um, we treat him more like his parents now. So he is great about shifting. He He's actually the best panda that we've ever had in terms of being a cub that shifts. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, just so for some of you, Shelly used to work with me uh, with the pandas um, and she'll remember Bao Bao. Uh, she was horrible about coming off exhibit. She would yeah. stay up a tree for literally hours um, we'd be out there with honey dripping all over us, could not get her to come off the exhibit. Chi-Gi goes in and comes out all on his own. Um, so our sort of our interaction with him is pretty hands off at the moment. We we just set up his diet in much the same way we do with the adults. Um, so he, he's really going along uh, on the on the progress pretty quickly. And it's pretty cool to see. That's so great. So we just heard from Don and he talked a lot about this, you know, operant conditioning, how you train the pandas, um, why you train the pandas. So why are we training? Why are you and the team training um, Xiao Chi Chi? So there's a lot of reasons. Um, the, the first one is um, that the early training, I put air quotes for it, is that we are in with him and we're interacting with him and we do it in a positive way. And what that ends up doing long term is it creates a really strong bond between us and him. Right from the beginning, he knew who we were, when he knew that we didn't present a threat. And eventually, once he started eating solids, he knew that we are the givers of the good stuff. So we can use that to then kind of help him um, in his life at the zoo. So we something as simple as shifting, going from point A to point B, is very important. We need those animals to move from one spot to the other. Um, and he does that, as I said, really well. But then we start moving on to some other things. So in this, the two photos that you see down there, um, that's my colleague, Lori Thompson. Um, she's the assistant curators at Giant, uh, curator at Giant Pandas. And she's doing what's called target training. So she's actually asking him to touch his nose to that tennis ball. And then when he does, she bridges him. So she'll say something like good, or sometimes we might use a clicker or a whistle. But with the pandas, we use verbal cues. Um, and then when he does the behavior, once she's bridged him, she then gives him a reward. So on the, the picture on the right, she's probably got sweet potato on her hand and he's licking that off. So he knows I touched the ball and now I get rewarded. And this behavior can lead to all sorts of other things. So if I want him to stand up, now I can just put that target a little higher. He has to stand up to touch it. And eventually I can take the target pole away and get him to do the stand up behavior just by asking for it. So those things are kind of early, but again, moving on to, to things that we talked about earlier with Don, we want to be able to do things like blood draws, ultrasounds, blood pressures. And so this early training that we're doing with him currently 
will lead to us being able to do all of those other things. Absolutely. So you're, it starts with building just a positive relationship that he sort of goes into it knowing they're going to ask me something, but I know I'm going to get treats at the end of it. Exactly. Wonderful. So is he doing some of these maybe more advanced behaviors that the adults do like a blood draw or an ultrasound yet? So not quite yet. Um, we are starting the blood draw uh, training behavior. So um, one of my colleagues, uh, Mariel, who's, who's another keeper at, at Giant Pandas, has started training him on the blood draw um, procedure. Um, it's in the early stages. We're just getting him used to reaching out through part of the enclosure that he needs to reach out through and grabbing onto a bar. Um, and eventually that'll lead to the full blood draw procedure, which all of our pandas have been trained on. Um, we've trained, uh, you know, all the cubs on it. They learn it really quickly. Um, we typically don't do a blood draw until they're over a year old. Um, there's no real need to do it unless we started to see um, some sort of issue with him. But right now he's doing great. So there's really no, there's no pressing need for it. Um, and so things like ultrasound and um, blood pressures and things like that, uh, we usually will we'll train for those behaviors is getting them in the right position. But again, because the animals, especially very young animals, don't really need all of those behaviors done, we don't necessarily go all the way to completion, like bringing the vets down and having them do those behaviors completely. Right. It's just about practicing and making sure, oh, here's a great picture. You want to briefly just describe what each picture we're looking at is? Right. So the one on the left, um, that is uh, Mei Shong is the larger of the pandas. That's his mother. And then obviously Chi Ji is there on the right. Um, and they're sitting on top of our scale. So it might sound like a super easy thing. There's a scale in the chute. You just, the panda walks on it and they get weighed. And with pandas, that is true. But I've also worked with animals like bison. And so animals that are maybe a little bit more fearful of their environment, something like a hoofstock, which is an animal that might get eaten by something, if you change their environment even slightly, sometimes they can be really nervous about what the heck is that. Um, so with bison, we take this long, drawn out period of, well, we're going to put the platform in, then we're going to get you to stand on it, then we're going to put the pistons under so we can get the weight, and that can take weeks or months. The pandas, I don't know what it is about them, they just walk onto the scale, they don't care. So yeah. for these guys, it's really easy to do that behavior. Um, and so when we were first weighing him when he was younger and couldn't really walk around, we would pick him up, put him in, on, in a bucket on a little scale and do it that way. I think but we've as he's all gotten seen bigger, those pictures. What's that? I think we've all seen those yes. pictures, yes. yes. Um, so once he gets old enough to kind of walk around on his own, um, we want to, we want to again, work towards getting him to do the behaviors um, because eventually we're going to get to the point where we're not allowed to be in the same enclosure as him. Um, this is um, Chi Ji getting his uh, first taste of sweet potato. Oh, wow. Um, and so this was just Lori and I one day in there. Um, and we were like, he hasn't tried sweet potato yet. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, I'm pretty sure the zoo put this video out with the full sound. So you probably can find it on the YouTube page. We were both uh, giggling because we were laughing so much because, come on, look at that. Oh, I absolutely can't help it. <laughs> And I do, you know, your job obviously is amazing. You are interacting with an incredible species every day. And I mean, this cute, you know, cub every day. But I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that animal care, uh, zookeeping is a STEAM career. Again, that science, technology, engineering, art, and math. What are some of those ways that you use STEAM? Well, so um, I, as I said earlier, I have a bachelor's of science in biology. So right from the beginning, I got my sort of background in the foundational ideas of what biology was, and I can use that, you know, as I move through my career. Um, one of the big things that we do um, is, again, sort of collaborating with other, either other colleagues at the zoo or other researchers. Um, so we will do things like, again, collecting urine for, um, for those hormone studies, getting the pandas into the right position. So if, you know, we, we we could do um, blood draws on them to look at certain markers that the vets might want to do a study about. Um, so my job, while I'm not necessarily the one that's doing the actual research, I play a critical role in the fact that I'm the one who can get either get the animal to do what needs to be done to get the the the, the sample, or I actually collect the sample during my my routine work. Um, you know, we we do a lot of um, again that training and stuff that we were talking about earlier is a big piece of, of how we do that. Yeah. Um, and then in, weirdly or interestingly enough, uh, we actually are part of the arts. Um, our pandas are trained. Uh, here you can see Chi working on his first painting. 
Um, so we've trained our pandas to paint. Um, that PVC pipe there, um, it goes through to the other side. It's kind of hard to see. I, I find this very interesting. It's a little bit of an aside. But where TG's hand is kind of at the top of that pipe, that used to be round. The first day that we gave it to his father, Tian Tian, uh, he bit on it and flattened it completely. So it gives you an idea sort of why we don't go in with the adults, because he yeah. could take a PVC pipe that thick and compress it into a flat piece. Um, but the idea is that Chi Ji should reach out, grab a hold of that um, bar, uh, that pipe. Again, we're using that operant conditioning. And when he grabs it, he'll move it around a little bit and he'll paint on the, the, um, on the little canvas there. I mean, beautiful. What a, yeah, what a he's artist. a very good arti artiste. Well, thank you so much, Marty, as you can imagine. Again, tons of questions coming in. So we will see you after our last guest. Thanks, Marty. Sure, of course. All right. Our last guest tonight is uh, Dr. Melissa Songer. Welcome, Dr. Melissa Songer. Hi, Shelly. Hi. Do you want to introduce yourself and what you're doing? Yes, I'm Mel Songer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a conservation biologist. Okay, so I'm familiar with conservation, saving species, and biology, the, the study of living things. What is a conservation biologist? Well, a, a conservation biologist can be many things. Uh, for me, a key part of the job is about using biological research towards saving species and habitats. So the, the application of our results to conservation my research in particular often supports reintroducing or rewilding species and restoring their habitat. So I work on some species that have gone extinct in the wild, such as the uh, scimitar horned oryx in Chad, the Shavalsky horses in China and Mongolia. And for these species, I often work with many partners around the world to translocate animals from human care to release them into the wild to help bring them back on the brink of extinction. And then I also work on species such as the giant panda that never went extinct, but are still vulnerable and they need conservation efforts to bolster them in their habitats against future threats and to encourage their population growth. That's so cool. So everyone we, you know, just heard from is working mostly with Mei Shang, Tian Tian, now Xiao Chi Chi, but you're more working to ensure that the pandas that we have at the National Zoo, their wild cousins have good habitats. Exactly. I study giant pandas in the wild. So analyzing their movements, uh, their habitat needs, their dynamics with other species, and also assessing habitat threats such as deforestation and climate change. We really need to understand their ecology and what they need to survive uh, to design better protection scenarios and delineate routes for better connectivity of habitat patches and um, increase their chances for survival in the wild. That's great. So what sorts of things make good giant panda habitat? Well, the number one thing everyone pretty much already knows is bamboo. Yep. Uh, what most people don't know is that in the wild, they only eat a few species of bamboo. Oh. And that can actually change depending on the season. They also only use habitat between 1,200 and 3,500 meters. So even though they're found only in the mountains, they also don't like very steep places. They don't like to be near people or roads. And so, um, they eat a lot, of course, so they need a large intact habitat patches, and they need those patches to be connected so that they can move around to find enough bamboo to find mates. So those are the kind of things we learn uh, through field research. Wow. So how are you finding these habitats? Are you using different technologies? Are you tracking the pandas or looking for the habitats themselves? All those things. <laughs> uh, so the main tools I use are GIS mapping and remote sensing, which is analyzing satellite imagery um, to map habitat, map human impacts to habitat, as well as uh, using satellite GPS tracking. So putting collars on animals to track their movements. So combining all this spatial data with detailed uh, vegetation and species data from the field, tools like infrared cameras. So using those to detect pandas and other wildlife putting this all together to model and predict impacts to giant pandas and other species, and using the results to develop strategies and then implementing conservation actions with partners on the ground. That's great. Can you briefly just describe what these two different maps we're looking at are? Sure. So these are showing uh, grids of the little dots are places that are being uh, where camera traps are deployed. 
oh, wow. on the left-hand side. So this is kind of a zoomed in version. Um, on the right-hand side, this is showing the, um, we have these three provinces uh, where, the, where the giant pandas are still uh, surviving. And then the red is showing where they're actually located. So you can see it's very fragmented. I mentioned the importance of trying to connect these, these patches. Yeah. Uh, so that's really important in terms of, of keeping their gene flow and their population strong um, to try to figure out ways to, to keep these as connected as possible. That's really, really neat. Um, so um, as many of our members might know, um, the giant pandas that we have here at the National Zoo are here under a loan agreement with our Chinese colleagues. And a lot of people are often curious. We know that many of our, uh, our previous cubs have gone to China. Um, and Zhao Gigi will also go to China. Will he, he ever go live in these habitats that you are finding? Well, no, he won't because he's from the National Zoo. He's going to be a superstar when he gets to China, just like his siblings, yeah. um, Taishan, Bei Bei, Bao Bao, they're all very famous. And so people want to visit him and he'll become a fantastic ambassador there. Uh, I'm hopeful that his offspring could eventually become part of a reintroduction program for release into the wild. That would be so amazing. So you spend a lot of time and uh, studying these giant pandas in the wild and their habitats. Can you tell us briefly, why is Zhao Jiji's birth so important to this species? Well, I think he's really a perfect example of what's possible when, we, when we're working together with experts and organizations around the world. You know, years ago, it was extremely difficult to get pandas to reproduce in captivity. And through research and sharing knowledge, uh, together with our partners, we really cracked the code on, on giant panda reproduction and you know, monitoring the reproduction, ensuring healthy and happy pandas, all the things that we've been hearing about today that we're doing at the National Zoo are really critical to that success. So, and it's really only by coming so far, we're now to the point where our partners in China feel confident enough uh, with the with the populations to, to start releasing them into the wild. So the hope that they can potentially bolster wild populations, which is, it's a complete flip from the situation uh, a few decades ago. And I think the fact that May gave birth at such a late age, I think that shows the amazing care that we have at the National Zoo. And so of course, I think he's really the, the perfect ambassador to educate the world about giant pandas and endangered species. And that ultimately gives us the opportunity to gain support for research and conservation uh, that we need to, to save them in the wild as well. I love that, that's great. And just, it's so applicable to all of the animals that we have here at the National Zoo, not just pandas. Um, do you have any, uh, can you tell us how you got into this career and like everyone else, any advice for young folks who might be interested in becoming a conservation biologist? Sure. I like. Most everyone I was a nature and outdoor enthusiast uh, since very young. I, you know, one of my first memories was when I was about five, I was on vacation in the Cumberland Gap and we went on a hike we, in the forest. I heard a lot of birds. I saw a squirrel. I found a, an old deer carcass. It had like ribs sticking up. And I, you know, I was just amazed that all these exciting things were just out there sitting around. I had no idea. And I can remember getting back to the lodge and, and people were just sitting around inside and I thought, do they have any idea what's out there? <laughs> Shouldn't we tell them? <laughs> and my parents assured me, we didn't need to tell them, but you know, I just assumed everyone would wanna know and, and would be as excited about it as I was. So you know, I, for my undergraduate degree, I, I had went in environmental science and in college I became really inspired by the environmental movement, uh, which was relatively young at the time um, the movement and me too, but um, that led to pursuing a master's degree in zoology. Uh, focus on I focused on the conservation of mammals in old growth temperate rainforests of the northwestern U.S. And then eventually I went on to get a PhD in geography, which was focused on endangered trop dry tropical forest ecosystems in Myanmar. So you know, growing up, I spent a lot of time hiking and did a lot of traveling. I got to see many types of ecosystems and learn about them firsthand. And you know, while I, everyone can't do that, I think there's a lot out there in terms of books, nature programs, to learn about the amazing diversity of nature, much more so than, than when I was growing up. I think another thing we didn't have back then uh, that people can join now are things like volunteering to pick up trash, um, especially like in more ecologically sensitive areas, planting trees, recycling, other things um, 
that can help the environment. And I really recommend jumping at opportunities like that. I think it's it's really inspiring to be able to make a difference for nature in those in those ways. That is just such great advice to all of our viewers. There's truly no limit to the things that we can all do in our communities to help save species. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, we have so many questions coming in, so keep those questions coming into the Q&A. Oh, I'm just quickly going to briefly mention, look at these awesome uh, camera trap photos we have. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and I think we'll run through that. Oh, that's some of the technology, the camera trap on the left there. And what is that on the right? On the right, okay, so this is a uh, radio antenna. So I mentioned the GPS collars, oh. and they also have a, a VHF beacon so that you can detect them. If you're close enough, um, you can use that uh, antenna to, to the, it'll beep and you can and fi help find them on the ground. That's really cool. All right, so now is the time. Um, Steve, Don, and Marty, if you would like to join us back on screen, and we are going to try our best to get through as many of these questions as we can. All right, let's see. First up we have for um, Steve, how come uh, artificial inseminations are not done at peak estrus? Right at that time, there's a lot of hormones at play. Um, the peak estrus is the point we're looking for, but the egg is actually released from the ovary a little bit after the hormones have to reach a certain concentration in the body to reach their target organs. So it's just a little bit after the, uh, the peak when ovulation actually occurs. Very fascinating, thank you. Uh, Don, um, Marissa wanted to know, what are the main diseases that pandas are susceptible to? So we, we break things down into what they uh, acquire in captivity and what they acquire in the wild, and there is some crossover. Um, in a wild situation, uh, there's a lot more um, uh, potential for infectious diseases, um, just things that they would come in contact with in an environment. Um, in captivity uh, and also in the wild, um, gastrointestinal disease is a concern. Um, when you have decided to go down a cul-de-sac of, of a habit and you be, you, first of all, you're a carnivore and you decide I'm gonna become a herbivore. And not only that, I'm gonna eat basically one grass. Um, you know, you set yourself up for a little bit of a challenge uh, as far as uh, being able to deal with that product. And so gastrointestinal obstructions, uh, potentially perforations from bamboo, um, uh, problems with environmental um, fluctuation. There are, there, it's, it's historical, there are, there are bamboo collapses in, in different regions in China. You'll have a die off of that one thing you eat, that's not good for you. And so uh, GI disease and, and food related issues are a problem in, in um, the wild and also in captivity. Um, Bebe um, had a uh, nice surgery uh, during the early part of his life to remove a gastrointestinal obstruction with the one thing he has to eat, which is bamboo. So, you know, there's a little bit of a challenge there. Um, in captivity, in, because we um, are so good at what we do, uh, or we think we are, uh, we, we are burdened, the fortunate burden of having to deal with geriatric care. So we have a lot of older pandas in our collections globally. And so things like high blood pressure, things like end stage heart disease, kidney disease, all those things, cancers, all the things that you and I being in a developed world are likely to succumb to, those are challenges that we have in a captive situation. So uh, we do see high blood pressure. Uh, we do see some instance of cardiac uh, disease. Um, we, our pandas right now, are, um, our two adult pandas, both have a little bit of arthritis in her shoulder like I do. Um, fortunately with the operant conditioning, they both uh, present for uh, therapeutic laser therapy, um, which if you've ever had it, it's quite nice. Um, so um, those are some of the uh, things we see in captivity more so than we do in a, in a while because their lifespan tends to be longer in the wild than, it, I'm sorry, in captivity than it is in the wild. So they live long enough to develop some of the problems that many of us living in a developed country, develop, we're going to develop as well, so. That's great, thank you, Don. Um, Marty, 
Uh, how does uh, Zhao Qiji's personality compare to his older siblings? Are there any similarities or differences that you're seeing having worked with so many of them? Um, so th the main thing with him um, is we, we all think that he reminds us a lot of his mother. Uh, he's, he's just, you know, he, he's very deliberate. He thinks about what he's doing. If, if any of you all remember Bebe, he did not think about what he was doing. As Don touched on earlier, he ate too much bamboo. He would fall out of trees all the time. Um, and then, so, so he's very different from Bebe that way. And then, as I said, with Bao Bao, uh, she could be um, very stubborn, uh, very much her own animal who wanted to do her own thing, didn't want to listen to us or her mother. Um, so Chiji, honestly, he's, he's been the easiest panda to work with just because he is so thoughtful about what he's doing and he doesn't overindulge. Uh, those, are, those are the big things for him. That's great. <laughs> so funny to hear. Uh, Mel, uh, there's a question. Uh, what have you learned through your studies that have helped the zoo support the giant pandas here? Hmm, that, that's a good question. A big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's worked so well the other way around. Um, you know, I think it's, it, it's, it is, important that we as a zoo are, are doing the work on the wild pandas as well and the wild species. I think that's, to me, that's, that's kind of a key in terms of maybe it's the educational opportunity to make that connection um, with, with the wild. And in terms of the care, a specific care of the panda, I'm not, I don't know. That's great. I mean, the no, diffusion of knowledge is always great both in both directions. yeah so i think that's wonderful all right we are back to you steve um do you know um what percentage of cubs born in zoos results from artificial insemination it's a good question um i think the percentage is probably pretty high knowing what we know about how, how pandas handle natural breeding mm -hmm. um i don't have the exact number Pretty high. The only one that doesn't have the answers. <laughs> no, I, our audience has some tough ones for you all today. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see, back to you, Dawn. Uh, Janet would like to know if the pandas get their teeth cleaned or any dental care. They do. Uh, Marty can probably comment whether they get any voluntary uh, dental prophylaxis, but um, all of our our carnivores in particular, uh, when they're under, um, if they, they have an anesthetic event, which um, at some point in time they will, we do a lot of stuff, as I said, voluntarily, but nothing really um, replaces getting your hands on an animal and, and palpating, uh, digging in and checking for things that maybe not, may not be visible on the surface. So when we have those animals anesthetized, uh, we do a, uh, we screen their teeth to see if there's any challenges or problems that are gonna require follow-up dental care um, probably from a veterinary dentist, which we utilize here at the zoo. Uh, at the very least, they get a, a, a scaling, a prophylactic scaling and evaluation of their teeth. Um, Mei Shang and Qian, um, as part of uh, some of the inseminations we've done in the past, have both been anesthetized either for electroejaculation or obviously for insemination. When we have them down for that, we always try to get the most bang for our buck because while anesthesias are common, nothing's without risk um, and we, we don't want to go back to the well any frequently than we need to and so when we have an animal down for something non-elective um, or elective but isn't their preventive exam we will work on their teeth while we have them under anesthesia and evaluate the situation so that's a long way for me a long way for me to say yes they do get their teeth cleaned so Great. hopefully marty cleans his more but <laughs> that's wonderful thank you don uh, back to you, Marty. Uh, both Rosie and Catherine want to know why Zhao Qiji doesn't interact with Tian Tian, his father, and if they will ever meet. Um, so to answer the second part first, uh, they will never meet physically, so they'll never be in the same enclosure. Um, but if you look in the yards that separate um, them, they, there are what we call howdy windows. So there are these two areas where it's mesh, it's double mesh, so they can't actually make physical contact. Mm -hmm. so they can come up to it and see each other and we've already seen them do that so they definitely have 
taken a look at each other, they know that they're there. Um, the primary reason um, that we don't put them together is that uh, while I have never heard of, maybe Mel has heard of this, but I have never heard of male giant pandas going after baby pandas. We do know in other bear species that that can happen. So we uh, do not want to be the zoo that determines whether or not giant panda males will go after their babies. Additionally, Meishan probably would not be incredibly happy about having a male bear coming anywhere near her cub. So uh, it's basically mainly for a safety issue, but also it's just not their natural history. Males do not play any role in the rearing of young, so there's no need to do it. And there are lots of, there are too many risks to, to take, even take a chance. Um, and Mel, uh, Yaren read that pandas are no longer listed as endangered. What does that mean to you? What should we be doing um, as citizen conservationists? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great point because it really shows, I think, how how far we've come in terms of the the conservation of the panda. They're still a vulnerable species, and I think it, you know it's it's not that they're no longer a species we need to worry about or study and, and, and um, work on in the wild. Uh, so, but I think it's, um, you know, it does, it does give us some, it, it's one of the rare, there just aren't many cases where that, that's happened. And so I think it, it's, it shows what is possible when we're, when we're really working together, we're working with experts and organizations and also, you know, the, the Chinese government really getting behind, you know, from, having 12 protected areas in the 80s to over 67 protected areas. And when you, when you really take those kind of actions that it, it, it makes a huge difference. So we can learn a lot from that. That's great. Um, I'm gonna wrap up. We are running out of time. I have two more questions. Um, first for Marty, in working with pandas, what surprised you the most? Huh. That's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever had it phrased to me quite like that. Um, I don't know. I, I have worked with a lot of different animals. Uh, it's probably going to surprise a lot of the people on here, especially the ones that really love giant pandas. They are not my favorite animal of all time. Um, I, I enjoy them. They're a lot of fun to be around, but I've worked with gorillas and orangutans and actually uh, Baird's taper, which is this weird hoofstock from South America, which is, they're really amazing. Um, so I think for me, Honestly, the thing for me that's been the most eye-opening is how popular they are, because I didn't come into it with that knowledge or even with that idea myself. So sort of getting to see the popularity, but then also getting to see how you can use that popularity to sort of get, again, to get out that message of conservation. People are so into giant pandas that you can easily grab their attention and hopefully direct it in ways that get them to think about what they're doing to the environment. Great. And I will wrap it up with a question for you, Mel. Um, again, just reiterating, what can viewers at home do today, tomorrow to help giant pandas in the wild? Well, I think, you know, we can, we make decisions every day uh, in what we consume and the way we deal with our waste and things like that, not just for uh, whether it's giant pandas, but really in terms of habitat for, for wild species. Um, you know, one, one issue that I uh, I'm very passionate about is uh, palm oil. I think that's, um, you know, something that has such a direct impact to forests of a lot of the species, not giant panda for, um, habitats, but a lot of the species that Marty was just mentioning, like orangutan, um, you know, these species that we love. And so, you know, there are things that we consume every day that, that impact forests. And then also the way we are taking care of our waste, whether it's uh, recycling or reducing what we're using, uh, not, you know, one use plastics, all these things that we, we get to decide what, no matter who we are, whether we're conservation biologists or zookeepers or any of these um, roles in giant panda life, we have opportunities to help giant pandas and, and wildlife um, and their habitats. So uh, I think it's a, it's a really good point, something we should keep in mind. That's great. Be a smart consumer, reduce, reuse, recycle. We have so many great questions and I'm so sad that we couldn't get to all of them, but I'm going to launch just another poll here. I just want to know which career that we heard about today are you most surprised by? The endocrinology technician, of, uh, our chief veterinarian, animal keeper, conservation biologist. Will you take that 
the poll, I just want to say thank you again to Steve, Dr. Neifer, Marty, and Dr. Songer for joining us for this very special Panda edition of Unusual Careers. It was just fantastic to hear about um, all of the people that are involved in the birth and care of giant pandas and how you each play a role in conservation. So thank you so, so much. Um, for everybody watching at home, if you want to learn a little bit more about the various panda careers, we have created a wonderful unusual panda career matching game. That link will be posted in the chat. Um, so on behalf of the Center for Learning Innovation here at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope to see you again as we continue to explore more unusual careers.